Morning, Castle Church. Good morning, everyone who is joining us online. It's very exciting, right? Next week, we won't have to register and we can just be here, which is great. Amen. Um, I'm Linnell, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I preached a couple mo- weeks, months ago. I preached in March about hope and about the importance of hope in our life and like what comes next, the, all, the bridge that hope is to so many other greater things in our life. And as I kind of reflected on that, there's so many reasons that that hope might be really hard for us to attain or to hold on to. But one of them, I think, might just be simple as we just don't exactly know who God is. And I think that there's this subtle difference between knowing my, how to do the church thing, right? Like I know how to say the right prayers and I know how to go to church and you know, I know how to be super friendly after and do all the church stuff. But then there's the part where you go home and there's knowing who God is. Because the church is made to kind of center or to wrap around God, right? And to support our relationship that is personal and private with God. And so I, I think... When I think about my own experience with coming to know who he is, I remember when I was in college and I went to Yukon Huskies. And, <laughs> and, and Yukon is like the most beautiful campus. And I remember it was in the fall, which is my favorite. And I just like looked out and it was just like your perfect postcard New England. You know, there's like a lake and like red trees and like old, old, you know, college buildings and stuff. And I just thought, this is my favorite. This is like my favorite site right now. This is everything I love in one moment. And I just very quickly thought, I wonder what God's favorite moment is. I wonder what God's favorite season is. What is his favorite sound? Where is his favorite place to be on earth? And it kind of just like blew my mind to think that God is someone that could have a favorite of something. But, but we're made in his image, right? And, and the Bible says that he has righteous anger. He has um, joy. He has hope. He has un- unending love. He has jealousy. He has all of these things that, that we have. So why wouldn't he just have things that are his favorite, you know? Um, and so when I think about knowing who he is, I, I want to talk today about just like a very small, tiny part of who God is, because we could talk for, for a year about, about all the different pieces of God and who he is to us, but today I want to talk about his faithfulness, and the title of the message today is Faithful Through the Ages, and I think faithfulness is important because when I look at my, relation, my normal relationships with, with the people around me, faithfulness is really what, what keeps people together right? It's what, when you've got friends that you've had for a decade, you know, and and family who live across the country, but you still talk to every single day, that's faithfulness. That takes energy, that takes time, that takes wanting, and that takes a back and forth. And so I want to talk about three different situations of faithfulness and times in your life where, where we can recognize God's faithfulness to us. And I know that God is faithful because our scripture today is Isaiah 41, 13. And it says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. What an amazing, like this is like God, right? God, and if you think of the millions of other problems and the millions of other things that are going on in the world, yet he says, like, to you personally and specifically, I I am still the one who helps you. I have your right hand. And so I know God is faithful already. And so I want to look at some different situations. And these aren't like, these are just things that I've kind of just like, I have categorized these into three things. Um... And I think that the three times of faithfulness that are the most important when I look at my relationships with people are the times that people are faithful to you and no one is looking, right? 
when you're like quiet and not yourself, but you're not like making a big deal of it, right? But like things just like aren't going great. But you've got that one friend who, who notices, yeah. right? Who sees you from across the room and is like, something's up. No one's really looking. No one's paying attention. You're not making a big deal of it. But that one person will give you a text or like be like, hey, should we meet up? Like what's going on? That's an incredible faithfulness. Um, The other kind of faithfulness I want to look at is a faithfulness when everyone is looking, which I think is a very deep kind of faithfulness. Because, right, you're taking big steps out in faith to do what God wants you to do. And not everyone is going to be on board with it. Not everyone is going to look and be like, wow, what a great idea. (laughs) Lots of people might even want you to fail. But then you have those that are faithful to you even when everyone is looking, even when everyone doesn't quite think you're doing the right thing those that are faithful to you, you remember, right? Um, And I want to talk about faithfulness to the end. Because think about your longest relationships, right? Those are are people that you're going to carry with you to the end. There's people in this room that I've known since I was like 15 or 16 years old because they're faithful and we're faithful to each other. And so I want to start all the way in the beginning in Genesis and talk about Um, God's faithfulness when no one was looking. And I want to talk about Joseph, who has an incredibly long and incredibly crazy story, and I'm going to summarize it. Um, Joseph is born into a family. He's highly favored by his parents, and so obviously his brothers are like a little jealous, but (laughs) take it a little too far. And what happens is his brothers... (laughs) Uh, they're like, okay, like, we're just going to kill him, obviously. <laughs> and then they kind of backtrack, and they're like, maybe that's too far. So then we'll just, like, sell him as a slave, as you do, right? <laughs> like, um, so then here's Joseph, who, like, went from, like, being really favored in his family, but still kind of really hated, and he's in slavery. And these are both places that I think, wow, no one, is, no one has Joseph's back, Right? No one is, is looking after Joseph except God, right? <laughs> because while he's in slavery, it says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. So he ends up like essentially running the house, right? So he's still a slave, which is not ideal. Um, but, he's, but he's got a good thing going. But then his, one of his masters sets him up like causes some ruckus, and, and Joseph ends up in prison. Another scenario where he's all alone, right? No one is looking out for Joseph. He has gone from one bad situation to another, to an even worse. And here's Joseph in prison, and he's there for years. But it says while he's in prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And so in all these instances, there are people who are supposed to have Joseph's back, who are supposed to be caring for him, who are supposed to see him, but instead they just continue to put him into a worse and worse and worse situation until he's, he's in prison, and I can't imagine that kind of loneliness. And what happens, though, is that God continues to be faithful to him. He has a very good ending. Um, God is faithful to him, and he ends up interpreting the dreams of, of the king and gets taken out of prison. And he eventually becomes someone who, who controls Egypt, essentially. So he goes from someone who is so hated by his own brothers who, that he's almost killed to controlling Egypt and being someone that the community absolutely relies on. And all of this is because God was faithful to him when no one else was looking. Yeah. And I think that that is, that is amazing because think of all the times that we, are th- we think to ourselves, dude, that person should have had my back, you know? Or like, this isn't my fault that I'm in this place right now. But, and it can feel lonely in our hearts, but God is always with us, right? Again, there's a lot of other stuff going on in the world, but God meets with Joseph in this prison. He finds him where no one else is looking for him and he's there with him. Faithful when no one is looking. Um, Faithful when everyone is looking. So I want to talk a little bit about um, David and Goliath, which is a story that I think a lot of us are familiar with, but 
David is a 15-year-old boy, um, teenager, sorry, and <laughs> there's this battle going on. So there's this war happening um, with the Philistines and the Israelites, and David's brothers are out like at battle on the side of the Israelites. But what David doesn't know is that every day there's this ginormous man from the Philistines who are, is coming out and is challenging them and is saying, listen, if you, can, if you can kill me, then you can just have everyone else. And he goes out and taunts them for 40 days. And every time he comes out, the Israelite army just goes and hides. And David is sent um, so that he can just give some food for his brothers. And when he shows up, he's thinking, like, what's going on? Why is, why is everyone hiding? Isn't this like a war? Isn't, don't you understand that God is on this, this side? I don't understand what's going on. And, and they're like, no, you don't understand. Like, look at this guy. But <laughs> David says, I'm not afraid. David says, because he's a shepherd, David. So he says, I've killed bears, and God's been with me. I've killed lions, and God's been with me. I'm still here. What's this one person? Who is this? And so, and so David very courageously just says, okay, I'll do it. I'll just go out, and I'll handle this. And everyone is watching. Do you think anyone thinks that a 15-year-old David is going to defeat a seven, eight-foot-tall giant warrior who's been trained to do this? And even worse, David, they try to give him some like armor and stuff. And David's like, oh, this is so uncomfortable. I'm just going to bring my slingshot, guys, because <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so David's just got his slingshot. He's got a couple stones. And he's just like, this is, this is fine. If I'm watching David, I am praying to God. <laughs> I am hoping that God meets him because <laughs> this doesn't look like a situation that can be overcome. But the Bible, David says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. <laughs> so <laughs> David clearly has had instances in his life where God has already proven himself faithful. He knows God. He knows God is faithful. He has shown up for me. Of course he's going to show up right here. And that's exactly what happens, right? He like very boldly goes up to this guy and is like, okay. And with one little slingshot, he just, he kills him. He conquers this giant enemy and everyone is watching. Everyone is there and God shows up for David. And if I'm like watching something like that, if I was there and my friend David goes out, I'm not like, okay, David, I'll go with you. Like, absolutely not. <laughs> That's such an incredibly hard moment to be faithful in. And yet God, God does it. God is faithful and he shows his strength and his power through his faithfulness and love and relationship with David. God is faithful when no one is looking. God is faithful when everyone is looking. And God is faithful to the end. And the scripture I want to talk about concerning that to the end is um, when Jesus himself is at the end of himself. When Jesus is on the cross and he's at the very end of, of his life, there's two other crosses on either side of him and there are two criminals that are there with him. And this is how that goes. It says, one of the criminals who were hangrailed at who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise." That is faithful to the end. Jesus is faithful when he himself is at the very end, right? There's like not many paragraphs after this that, that he's alive. One of the last things he does is, is talk to this man and give him grace and mercy. And when I think of this criminal, right, I don't know at the time like what justified being hung on the cross, what kind of crimes led up to that. But he's, he's outright saying himself that, that he is a criminal and that he is deserving of, 
of this punishment. But till the very, 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 very end, God didn't leave him, right? This man decides minutes before the end, like, this is Jesus. I know him. I know this is him, and I know he has the power to bring me to heaven with him. Think of that. A lifetime of that has led to him being hung on a cross, and yet Jesus was faithful to him right until the very end because it counted, because God knows that at any point in time, someone can choose to follow him and to love him. So think of all the mistakes that have been in your life, and, and God has continued to be faithful to you through it, and to me also. And so faithful when no one is looking, faithful when everyone is looking, and faithful to the end. And what does this faithfulness mean for us, though? Um, this is a piece of who God is, like I said, but the phrase that I keep thinking of is faithfulness begets faithfulness. So faithfulness bring forth, brings forth faithfulness. The more that God is faithful to me, the more I want to be faithful to him, which opens up more opportunities for him to be faithful to me. And it's this cycle that can go on for forever and ever of faithfulness back and forth. And when I look through the Bible, I think very specifically of Mary, Jesus' mom. And I have, I have a new daughter so I have a very new relationship with Mary. When I read her story, I'm like, Mary, you were doing the work. <laughs> like, I'm sure Jesus was the best behaved baby and he was the best toddler on earth, right? But she's still changing diapers. She's still chasing him through the streets. How, do you know how fast a toddler is? Like, Mary is doing the work. Even though Jesus, like I said, is probably the best kid you've ever met. She still takes on this giant task. And when I look at, so, and all of these situations of faithfulness are present in her life too. Faithful when no one is looking. The first time we really meet Mary is when an angel is coming to her and says, oh, favored one. Oh, favored one. And I can only imagine the relationship that she has had with Jesus up until that point right? The faithfulness that she must have known from God and that she was faithful back to him because faithfulness begets faithfulness. So faithful that she is called, oh, favored one, by someone who lives in heaven, by an angel who comes from, from the most beautiful, magnificent place. And he comes to her and says, oh, favored one. And so here she is, right? She takes on this, this mission, this is a mission from God to raise the son, of the son of God, Jesus. And, but she's engaged, right? She's engaged. She's not married. And so here's Joseph. And Joseph has a big decision to make because everyone is looking. Everyone is watching as Mary, right, is growing and growing. She's growing a miracle, but they don't know that, right? They just see she's not married to Joseph. So what does this mean? But, and so Joseph's thinking, like, maybe I kind of, like, I don't know, do, do I follow through with this? And an angel comes to Joseph in a dream and reassures him. God is faithful to Mary through Joseph, right? He is faithful to Mary when everyone is looking and, and thinking the things you might think. And then it goes on, right? She, so here's, here's her having Jesus, and then here's a little bit in the Bible of he's like 13, he's at a temple, and then he's 30 years old. What happens in all these 30 years, right? In all of these 30 years, there is Mary being incredibly faithful to the mission that God has given her. And I know that because when all of it kind of reappears 30 years later, there she is still faithful. And because faithfulness begets faithfulness, I know that God has been faithful to her in those 30 years, and she has returned that faithfulness to him. And so I, I think that that's, that's amazing, right? 30 years that she just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise this kid. And my husband and I talked a little bit. We're looking at our kid, and of course, so many pieces of her are us. And I think, are there little characteristics of Jesus that are things that Mary does? You know, the way she folds this or the way she does this, right? And God knew that. God picked someone that he thought, I, I want my kid to have these little pieces of who you are. And for 30 years, that's what happened. Right. 
And then we have when, when, everyone is, when God is faithful to Mary until the very end. So when we look at when Jesus is on the cross, he's at the end of himself, right? And these are just, this is the paragraph before he returns to heaven. And it says, so the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Which, as an aside, there's a lot of women there, right? There's a lot of women there. Later on, women are the ones who find the empty tomb. I think women are such a powerful part of Scripture. (laughs) Mary has the most important job as the mother to Jesus. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is John, when he saw them standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. In the next couple of lines, Jesus returns back to heaven, meaning that this this command, this this direction that he gave was the last thing he chose to do before he died, right? His very last thing that he accomplished was taking care of his of this woman who had raised him, of being faithful to Mary because she had spent her entire life being faithful to this mission. And I think <laughs> it's the last thing he does. And I think that it's just such a beautiful end to this. And if the musicians want to come up. Um, And so this message is about faithfulness. And I think that all of these situations of faithfulness, right, they start in Genesis thousands of years ago, and they continue to to right here in this moment, right? God is faithful to me right now when everyone is watching. (laughs) And, And so I encourage you to examine in your own life and to think about, oh, yeah, that had to have been God, right? And oh yeah, God is incredibly faithful to me because look at, look at my life right now. Look at what's happening around me. And I think as we examine God's faithfulness to us, it will grow our love from a place of, I, I love God because of the things he does for me to a deeper place of, I also love God just because of who he is. And You can't fake faithfulness, right? And so thousands and thousands of years of faithfulness, you can't fake that. And so he is truly, truly a God who is faithful through the ages. sing this song now with a with a different perspective after hearing that incredible word this morning God of Abraham the God of covenants faithful promises time and time again you have proved me, you do what to say. To the storm may come and the wind may blow, I will be steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness. Nothing 
My 